Okay, so the first thing is the exam will be Friday and it will open, uh, let's see, Friday is the 8th and it will open in the morning. And it will close at our typical time, 11.59 p.m. But this one I am going to time. So it'll be timed for four hours. So what I will do is I will open it at 8 a.m. And then any time during the day from 8 a.m. to 11.59, you can open it. But as soon as you open it, you only have four hours. So make sure that you have enough time to complete it within those four hours. And then Nathan, it will have chapter four and chapter six. So those will kind of walk through here in a moment, the details of chapter four and chapter six, but it will definitely have those sections. So in addition to this, there will be no class because I would rather you spend that time on Friday to work on the exam. So because we are doing things online currently, I would not expect to hold an additional lecture, rather just use that time to work on the exam. So, as I'd mentioned in the chat, it'll cover sections 3.7, chapter four, chapter six, and then section 5.1. And then typically what I do, as you might have noticed from the previous exam, is I will just put it in my open math. I will pull questions directly from the homeworks. So if you are looking for additional practice, the best way to do that is to go back through these particular problems and just try practice problems. But again, today what we will do is we'll go through kind of section by section or chapter by chapter and hit the highlights and things that I would expect for you to know. So in addition to this, I will say that it will be approximately 20 questions and it will be worth 100 points and it will count again, directly towards exam two. So on Friday, you will go into your My Open Math. You will open it up anytime between eight and midnight. You will take the exam within the four hours that are allotted. You will not need to show up to Zoom. You can just use the Zoom time to work on the exam and cover this material with approximately 20 questions worth 100 points. So are there any questions with the logistics of how I will conduct the exam? Okay. Yeah, it'll be very similar to how you um, dealt with exam one. So now that we know the logistics, let's go ahead and walk through each of these individual sections, and I will give you some highlights. We can look at a couple of examples. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to stop me either using your mic or the chat, and I can elaborate or clarify any of the formulas. So here is our review for exam two. So I'm just going to shorthand, call it E2. So for section 3.7, that was all on inverses. 
So for 3.7, the first thing that we discussed was the definition of a one-to-one -one function. And that was my shorthand for one-to-one. -one. So remember a function is one-to-one -one if the following is true. The y coordinates will not be equal to each other as long as the x coordinates are not equal to each other. So in maybe an English phrase, every input produces a unique output. So in the math lingo, what we're saying is your y values have to be different as long as your x values are different. I think another way to state this is you pass the horizontal line test. So I'll just shorthand this horizontal line test. So let's take a look at a few examples like we had done previously. So I'm going to just draw a couple of graphs here. So if I draw something that's linear, maybe in the chat, you can tell me true or false or yes or no. Does this pass the horizontal line test? Yes, it does. Good. So we're good here. You can see anything that's linear will do that. Let's try maybe a trigonometric function that looks like this. So how about this? Does that pass the horizontal line test? Good, so Nathan says no, Natasha says no, good. So this is one-to-one -one over here when it's linear, but it's not one-to-one -one if it's sinusoidal. Now you might ask why that's important. Well, in order to define an inverse, it must be one-to-one. -one. So by definition, an inverse is one-to-one, -one, passes the horizontal line test. So inverses one-to-one, -one, pass the horizontal line test. And then to take it a step further, the definition is the following. Remember our notation. So we use the superscript negative one of y equals x. And then I said if and only if. So the easiest way to write that is with this equals and then a double arrow. So that means this is true as long as f of x equals y. So let's talk about some of the key concepts here. The idea is that domain and range swap. So when I do an inverse, what I'm doing is I'm just flipping X and Y, and you can see that in the notation. And then I'm changing here. Here's the inverse, here's the original function. Also recall compositions. So maybe I'll just shorthand this. If you take the composition of the original function, F, 
with its inverse of x. Does anybody remember what that should equal? So let's think about the picture. Maybe this will help if I go x and then I take it through f and I get f of x. But then I take it back through, where will I end up? Yeah, exactly. So it should just be equal to x. So if I take the original x value, and I run it through the function f of x, I would get this notation. And then if I throw it through its inverse, I get right back to where I started. So remember, the whole point of inverses is that they undo each other. Now, the same is true if you go in the opposite direction. So instead of composing this way, I could do f inverse first of f of x. And if I do that, I should also end up with x. So instead of going in a counterclockwise motion or clockwise motion, I could do this in a counterclockwise motion and I would end up with the same thing. So this is how you will check for inverses. So on the exam, I might say, find the inverse of a function and then check using compositions. So you'd have to show that both of these are true. So you would prove this to me and then this to me. Another way that you might do this is using graphs. So give me just a moment here. Let's say instead I asked you to check using graphs. So if you were to graph your compositions, you would graph the original function the inverse function, and then the identity function, y equals x, and they should be symmetric. So we looked at several examples when we first introduced this section. So you could do this in Desmos and copy and paste it. You could do this by hand. There are several different methods that you could choose, but the idea is, um, you would graph the original, its inverse, then the identity function. And remember, the identity function is this one. So, for example, if you had an exponential, which we'll talk about in a moment, and a logarithmic, you would see that symmetry. Then finally, how do we find an inverse? So find the inverse, there were four steps. I'll give you the first one. So replace the function notation f of x with y to make things easier. Then maybe using the chat or the microphone, what would I do next? Any ideas? Yeah, exactly. So switch X and Y. Then how about step three? After I switch X and Y, what do I do?
So what we maybe do a side example, let's do something simple. Let's find the inverse of f of x equals two plus three x. So step one is to say y equals two plus three x. Step two is to switch x and y. Then what do I do for step three? So here's a hint, it has something to do with why. What do I do next? Yeah, good, so I'm solving for why. So in this example, we will solve for y. So I would have x minus two equals three y, or x minus two divided by three equals y. Make sure I did that correctly. X minus two equals three Y, okay. And then finally use our proper notation. So F inverse of X. So I guess I should say it this way, replace Y with F inverse of X. So our fourth step here, Maybe I'll do it right here for our example. F inverse of X equals X minus two divided by three. So that's kind of the five, uh, the four step process for inverses. Then you would check that using compositions. So recall from our previous board, if you were to compose the two functions together, you should get back to the original and you would have to show that in two directions. So first with the original function on the outside and then with the original function on the inside. So are there any questions with section 3.7 on inverses? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to chapter four. So chapter four was mostly review in week one and week two. We went into detail about linear functions. So in chapter four, we're just expanding our knowledge of those linear functions. So I'm going to summarize chapter four in one big um, lecture here. So for chapter four, we did linear. So there, there's a lot of detail in this chapter, but there are just a couple of things that I wanna highlight. Let's recall our definition of slope. So we could define the slope several different ways, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And remember we use the little m for the slope. In English, we call this rise over run. That's probably how you learned it in your algebra course, say in high school. Sometimes this might be written as delta y over delta x. So that's typically the first thing that you're going to want to define. And I also want you to be able to interpret a slope. 
So we looked at several examples when we were in, I think, section 4.1. So for instance, it might be something like miles per hour, or it might be centimeters per second, or cubic feet per second. So these are just some ideas of what a slope might look like. From there, we talked about equations of lines. And if you recall, we had three different equations of lines. So the first one is the point slope formula. So I'm going to go ahead and just shorthand that point slope. So this looked like y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is kind of the most standard formula. So you use this one if you are given, say, two points. The first thing that you would do is you would calculate your slope. So you would be given both y1, y2, x1, and x2. You'd calculate your slope m. That way you can plug it in. And then you would pick a point to plug in for the two subscripts. So maybe I'll ask in the chat, does it matter which point you choose? Exactly. So it doesn't make any difference. Natasha nailed it. it. You can pick either the first point or the second point, because in the end, what you're going to do more than likely is to put it into slope intercept form. And this is the one that you're most familiar with. Y equals M X plus B. So what information do you gain when you go from point slope to slope intercept? You can use your chat or your mic. Any ideas? Why would we want to go from equation number one to equation two? What do I gain from that? So Nathan, let me clarify. What would I gain? What information do I gain when I go from point slope to slope intercept? Yeah, good. Here was my hint. I gain the y-intercept. So the whole reason that I would go from equation one to equation two is that I get the y-intercept. And that helps us when we are graphing. So graphing this is a little bit challenging, but if I can convert it into the slope-intercept form, then I at least know the y-intercept and I can put that on a graph. I don't know, you know, I'll just make one up here but then maybe say, I know what that point is and I know what the slope is so I can graph the thing. So that's the whole reason for doing that. Does anybody remember what the third one's called? The third equation of a line? Excellent. So then we have finally our standard form. This one's a little bit different. We have some coefficient. So A is a parameter, something that would be solved or given. And then your variable X. B is also something that would be given or that you could find and your variable Y. And then finally, some constant C. Now, the whole reason that you might put it in standard form is because it gives you your intercepts. 
So let's take a moment to talk about our intercepts. So to find your intercepts, and this is true of any function, what you would do is for the x intercept, you set the function equal to zero or stated another way, set y equal to zero. Then vice versa, if you are finding your y intercept, you set x equal to zero or stated another way, solve for f of zero. So let's just take a look at an example. So let's say that we are given a function that looks like, how about four minus three X? And we want to graph this and find its intercepts and do a bunch of things. So there are several different ways that you could approach a graph. One way that you could do this is you could recognize, try that again, <laughs> that the y-intercept is four. Then you could go down one, two, three, and to the right and then down one, two, three, and to the right. So that's one way that you could graph this is using the y-intercept and the slope. So what I did for a problem like this, if you want to, you could rewrite it so that it's mx plus b. b is my y-intercept. So then I went down one, two, three, over one for the slope. And then I just repeated. Or what you could do is you could find the intercepts. So for the intercepts, let's just practice. So for the X intercept, what I could have done is set the function equal to zero minus three X plus four. So I'm doing this one first. So I get three X equals four or X equals four thirds. And you can kind of see that roughly right there. And then for the Y intercept, I plugged zero into the function. And that's where I came up with the four. So three times zero, which gave me four, which is this one here. So there are kind of two different ways that you can approach the graph. You can either use the original function with its y-intercept and slope, or you can find the intercepts. Either one would work. So any questions about this concept? Okay, so then the next thing that we briefly discussed, there might be maybe one or two questions in this section in chapter four, we talked about variation. So we did direct and indirect variation. So let me just review that quickly. So for direct variation, recall these are things that are proportional. So another way that you might hear this explained is if we talk about things being proportional to one another, so they look like f of x, or you have some constant times x, so k belongs to 
a set of real numbers. So perhaps your height is proportional to your weight or your shoe size is proportional to your height. And then we did inverse variation. Let me shorthand that. So this is where you just take its reciprocal. So one over K times X, which might also be expressed as X over K. And we looked at a couple of examples of those. So um, for direct variation, you might have something like Pivnert if you're in chemistry. And then for inverse variation, um, I'm trying to think of an example. You might have like luminescent of a candle versus distance. So that pretty much summarizes almost all of chapter four. So now let's move on to chapter six. So I'm going to find 6.1 and 6.2, which was exponentials and their graphs. So again, I'll just go ahead and shorthand here for sake of time. So remember the definition of an exponential, it looks like a coefficient A, so that's typically given times the base b raised to the variable x. So as a reminder, a and b are parameters, things that would be given typically or that you will find. And then x is the variable. So the only true variable is what you put into the function f of x, it being in the exponent, hence it being called an exponential function. And we did have some restrictions. A cannot equal zero. If A was zero, it would zero out the whole thing. And then you just have a constant function. Also, your base must be positive. So this thing we will assume to be positive. It's some real number and it's also not equal to one. So then we had kind of two different types of exponential functions. You either grow or you decay. So we have growth, which occurs when your base is greater than one. So that would look something like maybe two to the X or E to the X. So imagine hypothetically that you're living in a very um, prosperous river system. The fish are doing really well and they are thriving and they are growing in population by reproduction. Or perhaps you have decay. So decay occurs if B is between zero and one. Remember B has to be positive. So we're keeping it above zero. So can somebody give me an example where we might have decay? You can either use your microphone or the chat. When would you see exponential decay? Yeah, perfect. That's a great example. So bark beetles killing off oaks. So maybe I'll say something like bugs versus trees. So as a forester, that's a really good example. How about in chemistry? I gave an example of a chemical problem. Any ideas about how that might occur in chemistry?
let me give you a hint. Let's say that I have a stockpile of sodium and then 1500 years down the road, I don't have as much sodium. What's that called? Yeah, so it's dissolving and specifically what I'm getting at is half-life. So these, this is definitely a great example for forestry, half-life and chemistry. Um, computer science, good. So near the end of a hard drive, it starts to lose data, exactly. So you lose computer power. Um, the more people you put on a grid, the more things become complicated. So there are a lot of examples of decay. All of these are excellent. So that sums up essentially 6.2 or 6.162, and then we did 6.364, kind of in combination. So these were on logs. There were quite a few things that we discussed on logs. So the first thing that I want to discuss about logs is recall, what's the relationship, maybe somebody can write it in the chat, between exponentials versus logs? How are they related? What is the relationship between, say, let's do it this way, y equals 2 to the x, and then log base 2 of x equals y. What is that relationship? I'll give you a hint. If you go back to the very beginning of today's review in section 3.7, what is this relationship? Exactly, Natasha, they are inverses. So the whole point is that you can rewrite an exponential function in terms of its logarithmic function because they are just inverses. So as long as you have the same base, then you switch domain and range. So what I did is I just rewrote the exponential with the same base, and then I switched X and Y. So X would come first, and then Y would come second. So perfect. They are in fact inverses, and you could graph them and see that they would be symmetric about the identity function y equals x. So these are all interconnected. So 3.7 is directly related to what we discuss here in 6.364. So one of the things that I might ask you to do is given an exponential, be able to write its inverse or Vice versa, given the logarithmic function, be able to write it in its exponential inverse. So then we talked about all of the different properties. So in section 6.5, there were several rules and properties. Let's just briefly review those. So this is kind of a continuation of 6.4 slash 6.5. So a couple of things that we need to keep in mind because they are inverses, if you take a log of the exponential, so doing a composition log 
of the exponential, knowing they are inverses, you should get back to the original and vice versa. If you take an exponential and raise it to a log, you should get back to the original. So these were the things that allowed us to solve some of those basic equations. Then we had properties. So one of the properties was the product property. So we stated if you had a product, you could turn it into a sum of two separate logs. So if you are multiplying two things with the same base, you can break it apart. We also had the quotient property. So does anybody remember what quotients turned into? Or maybe let me state this a little bit differently. What symbol should go here if it's a quotient? So not division, Tyler, you're close. So products turn into sums. So quotients turn into good subtractions. Okay. And then our third property, which is probably the most important one is the power property. So it tells you, you can multiply the exponent out in front. So if you have something raised to a power, you bring the power out in front. We also have the change of base. So this told us if you have any log base B of X and you need to convert it, say to put in your calculator, you do LN of X, over ln of b. So now, nowadays, this isn't probably as important because you have technology. But back in my day, most of our calculators couldn't take any base. Like if you had log base 2 of 7, you couldn't put that in your calculator. What you had to do was ln of 7 over ln of 2, as an example. Then the last thing that we discuss for this particular exam was section 5.1, which is, I kind of combined 5.1 and 5.2, but we did discuss quadratics in detail. So I'll just call this 5.1 quadratics. And this is kind of a review from week one. So recall, first of all, the definition of a quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c. You can find the intercepts doing the exact same thing that we had done before. So I'll just reiterate. But sometimes, in particular with the x-intercept, so maybe I'll do this, it's not easy to factor. So you might need the quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus. Uh, square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And then you can find the vertex by looking at negative b over 2a, and then f of negative b over 2a. And then finally, we completed squares. So make sure that you are able to complete a square. This is probably one of the harder things to do. Um, we did this again in, I think, week two. So I do realize that this is a lot of material. And again, for the details, let me just pull up the whiteboard. 
my goal is to have you just work on these problems in my open math on Friday. I will open it at 8 a.m. I will close it at 11.59 p.m., but I am going to time it. So just make sure that you have four hours where you can sit down and complete the 20 questions that I will be assigning. It's open book, open note. You can use anything. It will be worth 100 points and it will cover everything that we've discussed. And I will not be holding an official lecture. Rather, I would just rather you use this time to work on the exam. So are there any other questions about logistics before I sign out? Okay, so if not, good luck. And I will see you again on Monday. And just keep checking your email. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your morning.